Hello, Internet! Welcome to episode 242 of the Assorted Calibers podcast, the Second Amendment podcast that is a little bit for everyone. I'm Weird Beard, and with me tonight is the most important voice of the Second Amendment and just an amazing person and the greatest hostess in the world, and I'm sure she makes cookies, Erin Paulette. How are you doing, Erin? Henceforth, I shall be referred to as Aaron Paulette, A-R-T. Ooh! <laughs> I, I know this. <laughs> I, I know this. Please, uh, please, but please enlighten the audience. All right, so last year, um, a Patreon creator called Ali Spagnola came out with a very funny YouTube video promoting her latest project, and it, it was a, an ART card. And she makes the point that there is no central accredited authority that handles postnominal letters. Postnominal letters being the fancy name for MD, PhD, um, Esquire for lawyers, CPA, things like that. And so she decided that she would create one of her own. And so. This would be the ART postnominal letters. That's capital A, lowercase r, period, capital T. <laughs> and all you had to do is like join her Patreon for a month at the highest level, and then you would get your name engraved on the card. And so uh, I was successfully marketed to, and I have one. And so now uh, I, I, I am ART. I am art. I have inherent value. <laughs> But Aaron, I hear you asking, what does ART stand for? And this is the part that successfully marketed to me because I thought it was so clever. Uh, and I'm doing this from memory. I may get it wrong. But I believe ART is from the Latin arguo titulum, which means I assert the title. In other words, my title is that I have a title. <laughs> I just thought that was so clever. That is so, good. N- now I have one. <laughs> I, I I I remember seeing this. It was a while back, so it's so it's so it's it's vague. But I I had missed the I had missed what it stood for. Yeah. Um. If you remind me, I'll put a link to the video in the show notes, please. And yeah, this one arrived oh, oh like a week or two ago. It was it was closer to my birthday. Um. But there there's a picture in the. Sh- Assuming I can find it here in Discord, there will be a picture in the show notes as well. All right. But yes, Aaron Paulette, A-R-T. Yes. And and yes, I know it's uh, presumptuous and poncy and all sorts of other supercilious words. I'm not going to lean on it, but every so often when I feel like I need a laugh. I, I'm going to refer to myself like that. I, I would broke, break out my inner McBain saying, that's the point. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, is, it, it, it is the post-nominal way of sticking your pinky up, pinky finger up as you're enjoying your drink. One doesn't, no, one doesn't have to, but, but I choose to. Ah, there it is. Look at that. That is an a, adorable card. Thank you. So that's how I'm doing. How are you doing, Weird? I am doing much better. I is what I am saying. I have it it it, it has been a, a a whirlwind like I said getting getting back from getting back from Texas, all the travel and all that. My daughter was also getting back from from school vacation, had a rough week. I had a rough week. Took a little bit of time to recover. I'm feeling I I I'm feeling a whole lot better. And then my daughter said, "I want to go to my grandparents' house this weekend." And we called my parents, and they said, "Yeah, we'll we'll take her." So I said, "Ooh, she'll be out of the house first. It was just it was just really you know one you know one and a half days." 
But I said, oh, she'll be out of the house. I'll, I'll be able to I'll be able to catch up on all the stuff because I've just been slacking. Self-care, self-care. And so I'll be able to catch up with everything. And so I made the terminal mistake of completely overbooking myself so that A, in this weekend that I'm supposed to re- so supposed to get some relax and recovery, I just felt like I was just rushing from one project to the next, and then because I oversold myself, I didn't. I I I got you know maybe three quarters of what I was hoping to get done done, and so I felt like oh you just you un- you just underperformed you loser, and I just like it was it was not a good weekend but boy today was a really really good day and i really i i put i put a whole bunch of bows on on various projects that i was working on and so <sighs> i feel better and now i am recording a podcast so 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 enough about how you're feeling did you reprise your role as the podcast bicycle is that one of the things that spread you so thin um uh well, I mean, I was, of course, I was on the Geeks, Gadgets, and Guns. I think, I, well, oh, I didn't, did I, uh, I don't think I mentioned that in the, in the, in the regular show. I know, I know I mentioned that when we did a, uh, when we did a mag dump together, but I, is, is that what you're talking about? I just didn't know if you were busy doing that. Plus, I wanted to make the joke about how everyone gets a ride on you. <clears throat> Actually, it was just, just, just the other way around. Do we, uh, Ryan and I didn't do, uh, handgun radio. Uh, this week he was he, he he wasn't feeling it and i was like you know what honestly i slept like crap the night before i wasn't gonna say i don't want to do it but if i get to go to bed early that's even better so <laughs> i am also well rested yeah when you were younger going to bed early was a punishment now it's a reward mm-hmm. <laughs> well i mean of course i've also got this like i'm a i'm a morning person and all of these people i do podcasts with are night owls <laughs> And so I just find myself constantly pinging and ponging between between staying up way too late and going to bed exhausted and going to bed at alarmingly early. Like, <laughs> why are you asleep and it's still light out times? Because <laughs> I'm tired <laughs> and I've got a flight of fancy cocktails. So I am I, I, I am in my happy place, Aaron Paulette. OK. And so. Can I tell see, you? See, I know what you meant. They are fancy cocktails, and you have a flight of them. Mm-hmm. But honestly, the way you phrased it, and flight of fancy being actually a phrase, when ah. you said I have a flight of fancy cocktails, it's for a moment I was like, "Oh, what does that mean?" <sighs> oh no, it's nowhere near as cool as I thought. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's instead of making instead of making one large drink, I made three tiny ones. I mean, I, I just, you know, if one were to make a cocktail called the Flight of Fancy, what would be in it? I have no idea. Oh, Aviation Gin would be the base spirit. Because you're a Ryan Reynolds fanboy? I mean, I I do enjoy Ronald Reynolds. I wouldn't call myself a fanboy of his. I I appreciate his work and, and he is good. But boy, he makes a really good gin. Like it is, it, it is not all marketing. So, but yeah, but that would be that I I, I will... I gotta think about that. I gotta think about that. But flight of fancy, I will think about that. I'm I, I'm definitely thinking uh, round red uh, the uh, the aviation gin and maybe some el- elderflower liqueur, just because that t- tends to have that little pinky raised. I'm um, fancy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but you know what else puts me in my happy place? <laughs> Well, this isn't the mag dump, so I can't say the first five things that come to mind. <laughs> uh, no, I am. I am not talking about anything filthy, Aaron Paulette. I am. I. I am talking about some uh, a a dirty little secret of the gun control world, possibly reach it, reaching its end, and that would be North Carolina's pistol purchase permit. Uh, the, uh, the, uh, I think it was the house. Now I gotta, now I've got to look at the, uh, at the, at, at the article to see. Yes. The house, uh, the house has passed the, the bill that was introduced in the Senate to repeal the pistol purchase permit, uh, with a veto proof majority asterisk asterisk. Yes, we will get to that. Uh, and so, yeah, that's. So it's it is looking good that it is it, it, that it it is DOA, 
but it is not a sure thing. Uh, but before I get down to the parliamentary uh, uh, stuff that uh, that we are expecting, uh, it is uh, um, it the dirt the the thing that makes it the dirty little secret is that it's a Jim Crow era law. It was designed specifically to to keep blacks disarmed in the state of North Carolina. And so the fact that, I mean, we talk about how racist gun control laws are. I mean, this was literally put in place by the Klan. And so the fact that it's still around today and the fact that the, you know, the people of North Carolina are pulling down statues of, conf- of Confederate war heroes uh, and yet, at the same time, they're still holding these these laws that don't have alternative alternate uh, alternative uh, symbolism to them, and are super archaic. So, for those that don't know, in North Carolina, to buy a pistol, you need a permit, and the permit isn't really what you would call a permit. You don't, you know go and take a class or get a background check or pay a fee and you get a little card that you have to show when you're buying a permit. No, you get essentially a coupon that says this person has passed a background check and paid a fee. And then, and and this permit is good for this period of time. And when you buy a gun, they take the permit and they give you the gun. So it is literally, you are paying essentially an additional tax of both your time and money Every time you buy a pistol, the good news is that if you have a concealed carry permit, that's essentially an unlimited pistol purchase permit. The thing is, though, that's not the worst part of this law. Mm -hmm. The worst part of this law is that when you apply for one of these permits, the issuing authority, which I believe is your local sheriff, can approve or deny it based on good moral character and there is nothing in the uh north carolina um um legal code that explains what those are Mm -hmm. It, it is quite literally does the sheriff think on a gut level that you should have this and yes there is some good that can be done from it if you're a known troublemaker if you're known to be a not down uh, alcoholic you can deny it but this has been and we we will talk about this later it has been disproportionately used to deny defensive firearms to minorities yeah that's true and and i will actually step back and say i i totally see where you're coming at with the with with the good side but at the same time also i'm just going to call bs on that we had I mean, it was years ago. We had we talked about a story where a man. Oh, I'm not defending it. I'm just saying yeah. there is at least the potential for some good. Yeah, but there... you know, I'm I'm looking for the silver lining. That's yeah. all. But I mean, there was there was a man here in Massachusetts that had his permit denied, uh, uh, revoked. Uh, he had a, he had a concealed weapons permit here in Massachusetts, and he had it ro- revoked for bad moral character. And the statement was that there were several police interactions where he was present where there was one where he was in a car with someone who was dealing drugs he had no drugs on him he had you know no issue whatsoever and he was never charged again he had a permit in good standing at the time that it was revoked uh has a clean background there was another time where someone was overdosing that there was a lot of people that were involved in drugs and the drug trade that were that were that were arrested around him and because of his close association with these bad actors uh they decided that he had bad moral character and therefore shouldn't carry a gun and i would say well i mean it's it's certainly a fishy story and it's i mean you could argue that He's I've certainly been friends with some people who have done some horrendous ear bleeding drugs that I have never partaken in. And I have made it a point to say, look, man, don't be to doing anything crazy with that stuff around me because I don't want any I don't I don't I don't want to get in trouble for a drug that I'm not high on. Um, and uh, and so that's absolutely a possibility. But if so, like if you really want to get after this guy and really want to get rid of his permit watch him closer like 
get it, charge him with something. If he hasn't been charged with anything, then he hasn't done anything wrong enough for an issue. And I would, and I would argue the same thing. All right. This person's a, you know, you know, a, a fall down alcoholic. Well, issue him the permit and then keep, you know, keep an eye on him when he's drunk and say, Oh, I see that you're printing and you're drunk. Can I see your, you know, can I see your, your permit? Can I verify that you're carrying a firearm? Uh Oh, you're carrying a firearm while drunk off to jail with you uh, or something like it's, if, if, if someone is such a bad actor and yet you can't charge them with a single crime, they're not really that bad an actor. And so this is just foolishness. And, and also I, uh, I mean, I, I could look, look it up, but I, I know I read an article a while ago, but noted that the, the, the permit fee is $25. And the reason why is $25 that in the early 20th century, when this law was passed, that was the weekly salary of a black freeman. And so the whole point was, oh, you want to buy yourself a gun? Well, a gun will probably cost you, you know, a couple of days wages to buy. And do you then, want a gun or do you want to eat? Yeah. And then and then we're going to we're we're we're, we're going to take another big uh, big chunk out of it. But it's very similar to the NFA where it's one of those like, oh, a, you know, uh, you know, a, a a Thompson submachine gun was what uh, uh, astronomically expensive, and it was like four hundred dollars. And then we're going to add a two hundred dollar stamp on top of that. Well, you know, if you're Nelson Rockefeller, that's that, that's no big deal. He can he can he can, he can, he, can, he, can out, he can outfit his heavy hitters with as many of those as he, as as he wants. But if you're just a sharecropper who you know is 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 worried worried about you know cattle rustlers or or something like that, well you know if you wanted to get yourself some you know something a little more substantial, you, you would break the bank. You could you could you, what what are you gonna buy that machine gun or a new farm truck? So the yeah it's it was it was designed to price. Uh, people out of there it was designed to in- intimidate and let's be on- honest it's still going on to this thing think about what is the political group that is most associated with defund the police and saying that we don't trust the police black lives matter so if you are part of black lives matter and you do not trust the police well First up, if you don't trust the police, then you probably want to have a gun because crime's still going to happen and something needs to be done about that. Uh, but at the same time, now you have to go into the police department and interview with the police to get a permit to buy a handgun. Mm-hmm. And this is the same reasoning why we, and by we, I mean not just Operation Blazing Sword, but... Um, the Liberal Gun Club and National Association of African American Gun Owners, and uh, who are the others? Was it the uh, um, the Asian and Pacific Islanders? Yeah, well, APAG away, but I didn't remember what it stands for. Asian Pacific American Gun Owners Association. Uh, oh, and the DC Project. Mm-hmm. And we we filed in Oregon when they tried to pass Measure 114, which was like the pistol purchase permit, but on steroids, because instead of just being a pistol, it was for every sort of gun. And so we filed against that and I haven't heard anything back on that yet. Uh, I will need to look that up when we get finished recording. But uh, as a result of that... I was contacted by Sean Sorrentino, friend of the podcast, who works with uh, Grassroots North Carolina, which is their state-level gun rights organization. And he said, um, the guys at GRNC would like it if you could write up something about the Jim Crow pistol purchase permit that we could take to the North Carolina General Assembly, which is their name for the legislature. And he said, we'd like something like a cover letter we could attach to a copy of the amicus brief where you call the Oregon measure like the Jim Crow era PPP. We intend to show them that we as a state are being held up to ridicule for having a Jim Crow gun law still on our books. And the idea was that once I would write the letter, uh, it would be handed off to the legislative action team and using it as a bludgeon. (laughs) against anyone who who stood against it 
And so I said, okay, sure, no problem. And I wrote a letter, and I sent it in, and he said, great. And, well, now we are at where we are, where it has passed. Okay, so we said uh, veto-proof majority asterisk. So I need to explain that asterisk. Um, the veto-proof majority is absolute in the Senate. In the House, they are one vote away. And so what they just need to do is wait for, you know, enough Democrats to not be there. Uh, and, and you know, they, they call in sick. It's a late session. It's, yeah, it's dirty politics, but that's how politics works. And so all they need to do is just wait for that one time when there aren't enough descending votes, and then they can pass it, and then they can override the veto. And they know it's going to be vetoed because they tried to pass this before about two maybe three years ago, and, you know, same governor, and he vetoed it then, and so that's why they're doing this now. And so, uh, I, I'm not going to read the letter. I mean, I like it, but, you know, the podcast is not about me, but there's going to be a, a picture of it attached in the show notes, and you know things are serious when I break out the footnotes. Mm -hmm. And so this letter to the General Assembly has no fewer than four footnotes. And so it, it cites, among other things, a, uh, a study by the University of North Carolina showing that black applicants were denied access to pistols at a rate nearly three times that of the white population. And so... <laughs> I, I am happy to help. I am I am not claiming full credit, but I I played a significant part in this, and and I'm very happy to help. Honestly, the thing that surprises me most is this is the sort of thing that I would think um, Naga would really want to be involved in, and I don't think they were. Hmm. So, but you know, I I've mentioned before I I really hate the North Carolina uh, triple P law, and hey, if we can get it removed then i mean that's that's good for everyone yep i was actually talking with sean just the other day and i said hey sean do you want to do you, do you want to take a take a victory lap for this and he goes nah i need to wait i want to i want i want to see what happens and he he didn't specify further and then i uh i i heard um i listened to the reload uh this morning and uh, they were talking about all the parliamentary procedures that they could do to um uh, to to uh, to push uh, to push this out on where it could be swung one way or the other, noting that, well, the governor could decide that his goose is cooked and he needs to sign it instead, and it'll it'll he'll look better that way, or it could turn out the governor will veto it, and then there was several the, the, it's veto proof only because several Democrats also sided with it, and they could turn back so that they're not considered. Uh, turncoats to their own party uh, because, of course, the governor is a Democrat. And so the idea is these pro-gun Democrats might, you know, it, it goes from principles to party loyalty. Uh, and then, of course, there's always there's always the off chance that a few Republicans might also turn around and say, well, I don't really want to do that. So time time will tell. Hopefully it will go through. But I'll even say that even if it doesn't succeed. This is something that has been a black eye on the state of North Carolina for well over a hundred years. And the fact that it's now getting this close to being repealed is, is nothing but a good sign because it will, you know, if, if, it, even if it doesn't, if it doesn't get passed this time around, it could always be presented again potentially to get more more traction or they could wait till a different governor comes through so it's i think that it's 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 days are numbered it's just it's just a matter of time i mean if you were so iffy on this why did we even have it as a segment for crying out loud <laughs> that wasn't a rhetorical question weird i'm asking you since i well I, I just i wanted to point out the fact that it's it's it, it's come here so it's just we we will see i don't i just want to be i i i am taking a victory lap but i also want to be honest Okay, and I just want to let people know that that, that that there'll be there'll be another segment for it coming coming up soon. All right, all righty then. Let's let's talk about a more sure thing. 
in the in the state of California, the 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 state where where the gun laws are so bad that they're just dropping like flies. Uh, in this one, a federal judge on Monday has blocked California from enforcing a state law requiring new semi-automatic handguns to have certain safety features, finding it violates the right to bear arms under the Second Amendment of the U.S. Constitution. This is the California uh, handgun safety safety roster. Uh, unfortunately, how it will be interesting to see if this will apply any further. Uh, outside the state because of course massachusetts has also has a handgun safety roster and i am one of the hosts of handgun radio which means that it greatly pains me um and so yeah the we will we'll see where it goes but at least now again californians have the absolute miserable uh situation of being that these guns need to have like micro stamping and micro stamping doesn't exist. And so therefore new guns come out and there's just no way to get them approved outside of, of course we had Clark on several episodes ago talking about the, uh, the, the P three twenty that essentially has no magazine at all. It is 100% a single shot pistol, but because it's a SIG three twenty, you can buy this barely functional pistol legally under California because as a single shot, it's exempted from the, the safety roster and then take off all the California compliant parts and put on standard uh, SIG parts and away you go. And uh, and you can have a fully functional SIG 320 minus the magazine bands that they have in California. So the the handgun roster is part of this 2001 Unsafe Handgun Act, right? Correct. And so for a pistol to be approved under this roster, it's got to uh, meet all these qualifications, right? Correct. Okay. I mean, I'm going through this asking you these questions because one of the things on there um, is the the, the loaded chamber indicator. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, you know, that's not really a bad thing. Uh, they've also got the um, what's it called the, the the magazine disconnect, which I'm iffy on. The point that I'm getting at is, and I guess I just want to clarify this for the viewers. Um, the main problem is that it requires micro stamping. Micro stamping doesn't work. That is what has prevented new guns from being added. That's the bad part, right? Uh, that that is that's the worst part. I would argue that. All the all, all the the safety features that they require uh, that uh, that are I wouldn't say standard but much more you know fairly common be it magazine disconnects be it loaded chamber indicators uh, you know tr- trigger pull weights what what whatever what have you uh, if if those if a, have, not having a loaded chamber indicator made a gun considerably more dangerous then why would a gun company not put one on their gun. And I, I will personally say that I don't have any of the guns that have the, uh, the flag style loaded chamber indicator where it pops up a, a widget that says that, Oh, there's a, uh, no, that's not true. I've got a Walther P 38 that has a, that has a, uh, that has a little, uh, little pin that protrudes from the back of the slide when a round is in the chamber. But, uh, uh, most of most of mine are that have loaded chamber indicators have uh, or what's called witness hole where there's a little hole drilled in the chamber hood. And so if you look down into the hole, you will see a little usually it's the the rim of the cartridge in there. And I that's one of those things that I specifically do not mention to new shooters, mostly because when you're looking down this little hidey hole, you you naturally it's just a little hole so you naturally want to get the best light on it which means the person starts moving the gun around willy-nilly and it may have a round in the chamber and they're now getting very sloppy with the muzzle and uh and and that is not good so instead you should just you know press check or in the case of if you're standing on the firing line yeah just pull the point it, point it down range and pull the trigger that that's a good way to know whether it's loaded or not so I, 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 I don't, I don't like any of these features because 
there's no sa- piece of safety equipment on a firearm that is useful that will um i mean obviously you can you know have the gun be blank firing only and it will be considerably less dangerous but even then they can kill people um but a gun that a gun that can put a bullet into a bad guy is also a gun that can put a put a bullet into your own foot uh or or into into a good person and there's no mechanical feature that is uh, a replacement for good training and and good safety knowledge and so you you can say all you want about oh this feature and that feature and this or that but of the vast majority of all modern firearms if you're handling it properly it is perfectly safe um the one, the the one that I would argue that uh, that actually is nice, that is required by California, and I would argue is almost completely ubiquitous, is uh, drop safety. The yeah, if you're if if a gun if your gun will potentially discharge when, when dropped, that's that might be a gun that needs to get relegated to a, to being a range toy. But at the same time, yeah, as someone who has dropped a gun at least once, I'm very happy for drop safeties. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, no, I concur, and that's and that is that is one of those ones that the when I am taking a new shooter to the range, is the I I will always let them know. Yeah, if if the gun is ever going to fall, just step out of the way. Don't try to grab a fa- falling gun because, God forbid, you try to grab a falling d- gun and you grab it by the trigger. That's that 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 could be that could be a very a very a very a very bad event. So just. Step back away. If my gun falls on the ground and 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 the finish gets messed up, that's what happens. I'm not concerned. And the uh, but I do have I do have I've got I've got I I've got some old oldie moldies. I got a whole bunch of old guns that are pre drop safety and are, are and are not drop safe. And those guns do not come to the range when uh, when when new shooters are being instructed. So yeah, this is. This is a uh, this this is overall a, a bad law, especially since I mean it's one of those Glock is still making the I think it's the third generation gun because it's the only one that's allowed to be sold in California. They've they've moved on well before. It's not like Smith and Wesson makes the the first generation M and P, but because this Glock this Glock is on the on on the approved roster, they they still keep making it so they can still sell it to the sell it to the people in uh, people of California. Uh, all because of this absolutely stupid and and oppressive law, and that's the whole point. It's not it's not making the gun any any safer. Again, police are completely exempted from this. People who carry guns every single day and are not particularly well trained, no matter what anybody tells you, the they're perfectly safe enough for these people, but they're not safe enough for you. I wonder why. And so. This is gone, and hopefully this leads to other lawsuits. California has the most egregious of the handgun rosters that I'm aware of. Massachusetts is pretty bad. Uh, Maryland's is actually kind of all right. Is uh, at least that was what Alan Gura told me. He's like, I he says, I, if I'm going to go after handgun rosters, I don't want to go after. Um, uh, I don't want to go go after. Um, uh, uh, Maryland because essentially, if your gun is it, you know, meets the criteria, you can get it on the list. No problem. You know, it's just a, just a question of complying with complying with the laws. And he says, that's not, that's not, that's not a good angle of attack. I need to go after someplace like Massachusetts where you can make a gun that completely com- complies. Every single Glock is on the Massachusetts handgun compliance roster. And no, you can't, you can't, you can't buy a new one. You need to buy one that's grandfathered in. Because it's unsafe. Because reasons. Because it's unsafe, and unsafe. Why? Eh. So there was. Uh, there, I, I don't know. Weird. Unsafe. Why? There. No. Nothing. They. They. There are tests. So you, to get a, to get a gun on the on the on the roster, every gun of that catalog number. So. Again, I I note that there was a, there was a Julie Golob edition uh, M and P that had a. I think it. I think it had the Julie Golob's name or signature engraved on the slide, and a little um, a little breast cancer awareness whip ribbon, and it was shipped with a pink backstrap. So the you know you you have an M and P, you know that the backstrap's not part of the gun; it's just mm-hmm. kind of clipped on, and so you you could 
in fact, essentially mimic this gun by buying a pink back strap and just replacing your standard black one with the pink one. And so that was the Jula Golob edition. That's a completely different catalog, even though the gun is identical to the standard M&P nine, uh, it was a different catalog number. So that one would require a different, uh, um, a different, uh, a, a, it has a different skew. And so therefore it, that would need to be submitted separately. Same thing with the, if you were selling a 1911 that had uh, hard rubber grips and then a slightly nicer one that had, uh, that, that had rosewood grips, that's a completely different gun per the state of Massachusetts. And it would need to be submitted for testing. So step one, pick, <laughs> pick the, uh, the 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 most representative gun that, that that the company makes and 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 submit five of those to the to the testing they will be tested by some certain standards that are that are enumerated such as uh trigger pull weight drop testing um there's some stuff with like the metals like you're not allowed to have zinc components in the gun uh and then so no high points correct yeah no high points no lorisons no ravens yeah that sort of sort of stuff uh, though you could buy Wal- Walther P22s. So I, I, I don't remember reading that one specifically. I just heard, I just heard someone, someone, uh, from a uh, goal mention that the other day. And, uh, but I, but I, 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 I need to track it down, but essentially it's all enumerated. And then you get your approval letter if the gun passes and any gun maker that's submitting it should know whether it'll pass or not. Then it goes to the attorney general's office. And then it either gets a letter that clears it for sale or it doesn't. And that nobody knows. The The word on the street is that that the Glock loaded chamber indicator, which is essentially just some orange paint uh, painted on the side of the, uh, the extractor. And so when there's a loaded round in the chamber, you see a little bit more of the extractor and therefore you see this orange paint. Uh, is not enough of a loaded chamber indica- indicator for the AG's office, but it's not specified. And there were several gun companies that never even submitted guns because they said they couldn't get a guarantee that if the gun passes with flying colors, it's going to get approved. So you can pass and still be denied. Correct. Because that's fair. Yeah. I mean, it's just like the the uh, pistol purchase permit. You can have a clean background and, and, and all that stuff, but you can have bad character. And what does bad character mean? Whatever we think it means. You're wearing socks with sandals. No pistol for you. Yes. I mean, well, that I can get behind. <laughs> <laughs> he said jokingly, it's fine. You can wear your <laughs> socks with sandals. Having seen what you wear, you have no leg to stand on when it comes to criticizing fashion none (laughs) oh you wound me aaron Prelet. it doesn't matter if it's true (laughs) you have the most stereotypical guy wardrobe and by that i mean you have okay these are your shirts and they all come in a certain range of colors and then you have your pants which you are either jeans or or slacks and Everything is modular. You can reach into your closet blind and pull out a shirt and a pair of pants and it'll go together. Guilty as charged. <laughs> Intentional. Like, yeah, if it doesn't go with everything else I wear, it gets donated. I say I say th- I say thank you to the person very nicely and then when they're not, when they don't see me it go it, it go it goes off to the donation center. It's like the grown-up version of Gur animals. <laughs> it's very much that. <laughs> I, I am modular. <laughs> Uh, so now on to, this is really the story that I, I wanted to talk about cause it's kind of the big news of the week. Oh, good. Cause I don't want to talk about this at all. So yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll let you take most of this. Yeah. So, uh, so, uh, yeah, uh, Joe, Joe Biden went to Monterey park, uh, uh, California, which of course was the, uh, the site of, of a mass shooting and, uh, Never mind the fact that it's in California, and we were just talking about California's handgun roster, and uh, noting, uh, yeah, I believe, yeah, the the gun that he was shooting at was a handgun, and it was not an approved handgun. And I, I, I still, I actually haven't even followed up to see if they've if they've actually explained what the story with this gunman is, because he technically speaking shouldn't have even been able to own guns, but he sure did. Um, but so he used this as the, as the place to say to to announce that he has 
uh, has has signed an executive order that is uh, uh, that is that is essentially enacting gun control. Uh, and so first up, saying that this is an act of desperation. This is very much like um, uh, preemption laws, uh, and you know, saying that like, oh look, the 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 anti gunners they want national law. They want a national ban on AR-15s. They want a national ban on handguns. Uh, but if they can't get a national ban, well, they'll just pick the states that are the most anti-gun and get the bans there. Well, if they can't get the ban in the states, well, then they'll find the most anti-gun cities within that state and get them to enact gun control laws. It It's the same thing. He... Joe Biden has been talking big talk specifically about banning assault weapons and and uh, banning assault weapons and essentially making it illegal to make guns at home. And he has pushed really, really hard for that. And there have been laws presented and they go nowhere. And so because he can't get a law to his desk for him to sign, he is. And, and of course, he's also been asking the ATF to declare fiats and those are happening and then getting shut please explain what that means uh the fiat the atf to declare fiats yes so so the statement of the okay so the atf uh had uh essentially re redefined what a firearm meant uh what a firearm is in a means to ban ghost guns as he calls it and uh and they're so they're just there's no new laws nothing has Nothing has changed. They're just interpreting the laws differently. And uh, and so it's just by their ATF declaration that just same thing with the pistol braces. Pistol braces were perfectly legal. Then pistol braces were Ill- legal only if you didn't touch them to your shoulder. Then they were perfectly legal again. And now they're going to be illegal shortly unless the courts strike it down, which they've done with most of the things recently. Or like how... Bump stocks, by any legal definition, weren't machine guns. Mm -hmm. And then Trump did an executive order and the ATF said, "Okay, they're machine guns. Correct. So that's that's how this is going. And so this is essentially very similar to that. I'm trying to remember if Trump actually signed an an executive order or if it was just a, a an advisement to the ATF to to crack down on on bump stocks. But. Either way, I'm trying to remember what the (laughs) I read this this morning. Um, Okay, Uh, I don't believe it was an executive order. He signed a memorandum instructing the attorney general and the Justice Department to propose regulations. mm -hmm. I mean, a distinction without a difference, if you ask me. It's all semantic because really that's what. Hmm. Well, there's what executive orders are meant to be, and then there's what they really are. What they are meant to be is when the president issues a directive. Hey, people, I would like you to do X, Y, and Z. Please make it done. You know, I I would like the cabinet to make these uh, decisions. I would like Congress to pass these laws. And it's really just a very formal, Simon says... (laughs) Yes. Although it doesn't carry the weight of Simon says it, to be honest, because um, if you've got, you know, an opposing legislature, they can go. No, that, that's how executive orders are supposed to work. Um, but as we've seen before in the past. Oh, I know it was definitely through the Obama administration. Maybe uh, Bush, too, did it. I don't know. But executive orders started to become an end run around the legislature. And so, you know, well, hey, I want it done, so it's going to happen. And so that's – I don't know if that's what Biden truly wants, probably. Uh, I mean, the way it's phrased here, it goes through all the motions of, you know, directing the president's cabinet to do X, Y, and Z. And it, it doesn't have any force of law, but it sure seems like – the government is going to interpret it as such. Yeah, there, there, there is a. It's, it's very. Every report that I've read on this says that it's very, very nebulous. Again, it is desperation, and again, this, this goes way, way back. I mean, it's, it's my personal understanding that the executive order was designed so that the president could issue essentially an emergency act where 
he doesn't have time for con- for somebody to draft a, a bill, have it go through both, you know, both both houses and then to his desk for whatever the emergency is so he can enact an executive order as an emergency power. And it is there, but it is also ephemeral uh, in the fact that an executive order can immediately be destroyed by another executive order. Hence why when Trump took office, he just spent like the first like week that he was president just vetoing, just uh, signing executive orders that disbanded Barack Obama's executive orders. And he had a pile of them. Um, but it also has been used as an end and, and, uh, and round and not just for, uh, for, for Democrats because, uh, the whole, uh, 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 Im- importation of sporting firearms, that was an executive order from George HW Bush, the first, uh, pr- pr- the first president Bush. So there have been all sorts of things that act like the law of the land, but are simply executive orders. And the bottom line is like, we, we need to crack down on this crap. We need to change it so that like it needs to be an emergency um, or maybe even, maybe even give like a, a one, a, a one year sunset on every executive order that after a year it disappears. So Congress has one year, if it's such a big deal and that it needs to be permanent, Congress has one year to, to, uh, to pass a law and which should be easy because it's already written down because the president did the executive order. And so, yeah, we, it's, this one's very nebulous. Again, it's desperation. He can't do any of the things that he wants to do with this executive order. And so he's doing something and making a whole lot of noise about it and making political grandstanding. He didn't do this from his desk in Washington. He did this in California at a, at the location of a mass shooting. You know, never mind again the irony of that. Mm-hmm. And so we will see how the interpretation goes, or maybe it'll just get shot down by the Supreme Court. Because again, the court's been pretty strong for us because, well, <laughs> Clarence Thomas didn't stutter. I mean, there are some things that jump out at me at this, and I'm definitely not going to analyze every single thing. But uh, I, I, I did find a gem within the turd. And he does want to address the loss or theft of firearms during shipping, Mm -hmm. which we can all agree is a good thing. And uh, apparently firearms, firearm theft has increased 250 percent since 2018. And I know people who work at gun stores and the uh, post office has been sloppy and You know, it's supposed to be signed for and they just leave it there and someone comes up and steals from them. And so that is a good thing. It it is probably the only good thing. The another thing that jumped out at me, and this is probably just lawmakers not understanding how gun works, but uh, they they talk about, okay, they want to help catch shooters by accelerating federal law enforcement's reporting of ballistics data. Okay. And so something that I'd never heard of before, the National Integrated Ballistics Information Network uh, allows federal, state, and local law enforcement to match fired cartridge casings to the guns from which they were fired. Um, I mean, the only way that could possibly work is if it were micro-stamping, and we've already agreed that micro-stamping doesn't work and hasn't been implemented. So, I mean, did they get confused and mean... um, there you is know, the actual bullets themselves. Is there something else going on? What? There is some forensics that involves how the extractor claw grips the cartridge casing. If there's any, how the ejector strikes the casing. There are marks that are unique to at least a firearm design. And again, I don't know the top of it. I mean, honestly speaking, I for the longest time just assumed that that when you hear about like the the forensics of the bullet. It was only for the the fact that oh this was a you know a, a gun that had you know the lands and grooves were you know this far apart and this depth and there's this many in the in the barrel well let's see this could be a Walther P ninety nine made within these years before they redesigned the barrel or it could be a car arms something or other um you know at you know in this model year because that was when they were using this style of barrel 
Uh, mm, okay. But I, I, I have I have been told that actually the the markings on a bullet are indeed actually unique to each individual firearm. So and I have no idea how that's possible, but I guess it is. And so, well, wait, bullet or casing? Because you said bullet. Did you mean I, casing? No, I did. I did. I did say bullet. I, I as far as the casing goes, there might be that. I've never actually talked in depth to someone who is an expert on this on on the issue of actual bullet casings. I've only talked about the the actual like rifling marks on the projectile itself. But I do know that there is handling marks on the casing from the gun the 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 gun the magazine and the you know the the ejector and the extractor and uh, and those various parts and of course also the firing pin uh mark on the primer so there are marks and you can i mean obviously everyone's been you know digging through the brass bucket at the range and suddenly going oh look this one was shot by a glock because glocks have those very very interesting pyramid shaped firing pins and so you, you you could tell you you could tell from a, a distance away that that the that shell casing came from a Glock and not any other handgun. Okay. But the final thing that I want to talk about is where it says and I'm going to be quoting the whole thing because I think it's important. Use the Department of Defense's acquisition of firearms to further firearm and public safety practices. The Department of Defense buys a large number of firearms and other weapons to protect and serve our country. The President is directing the Secretary of Defense to develop and implement principles to further firearm and public safety practices through Department of Defense acquisition of firearms consistent with applicable law. That's a lot of words, and it doesn't say anything. Okay, because the Department of Defense, and it buys guns, and it's got to implement principles for buying guns that somehow helps public safety. I mean, the Department of Defense has nothing to do with public safety. I mean, that's why the, the Posse Comitatus Law exists. It, it, there, there's nothing here. I have no idea why they said it. I don't know what they're trying to accomplish. It, it's also why people also get very pedantic when someone refer, re- refers to uh, police officers versus the public, you know, the, the, the general public as officers versus civilians. But it's one of those like no the if if when you get when you when you get pulled over for a uh, for a traffic violation you're sitting there in your car as a civilian and the officer is there talking to you as a civilian um, they they are peace officers they are not part of the Department of Defense and so therefore they are not in the military so therefore they are civilians as well and so yes this appears to be possibly some leverage to get firearms makers to behave in a certain way in general so that they can maintain uh, government contracts. But also at the same time, um, right now, like with the, you know, Sig Sauer, you know, critting the M5 carbine, those, those contracts are already signed. Those, those, those firearms are already being delivered. So it's not like, the Department of Defense can can go back on it, going, "Uh oh, you're not putting loaded chamber indicators on all your guns, or you're not, you know, selling them with trigger locks. What you know, what whatever have you, whatever rules that they're trying to push, and are going to try to poison uh, that company with, um, it, it, it isn't an issue. So this could just be virtue signaling because they're saying a big talk, but I mean, imagine." not picking the best firearm for the military because of gun control practices. <laughs> yeah. Not seeing it. I mean, I don't see it either. I'm just a- agape at all the words that were used mm-hmm. to say nothing. I'm, I- I'm, I'm impressed actually. Yeah. I think, I think it's, I think it's very clearly, it just reeks of desperation. And so I think that, uh, yeah, that, 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 Biden is frustrated and has been unable to pass the gun control that he wants and is frustrated that a lot of his anti-gun actions that are going on are getting shut down because the Second Amendment is being seen for what it actually is. Um, And so now he's just grasping at straws and trying to find something that'll hurt us. 
So, but a lot of a lot of me talk on how this gets implemented. So, shifting gears, but keeping our eyes on politics and the political landscape. The last time we heard from the Geeks, Gadgets, and Guns crew, it was Liberty talking about fighting against red flag laws and pushing for constitutional carry in Nebraska. Now, her husband Matt is joining us to talk about how, while Nebraska is a gun-friendly state, there is a lot to be desired. <laughs> Hi, Matt of Geeks, Gadgets, and Guns here, and thought I should give you guys a little update of what it looks like here in the Midwest. And honestly, everyone thinks of, oh yeah, it's the Midwest, it's it's gun-friendly. Well, Nebraska, we're still working on constitutional carry. Maybe we'll be 26, maybe we won't. The current bill, as of the time of this recording, has passed its first hurdle, which is getting through the first reading, because Nebraska... Weird legislature, weird state. We only have a Senate, no House, no none of that. So it has to go through three readings and be passed by the Senate three times, and it has some secondary intermediary steps. Right now, the Nebraska bill has made it through the first reading, but then it has to go through and get marked up, then go back for a second reading and a third reading before it can finally be sent on to the governor to become law. Ironically, probably the most important part of the Nebraska constitutional carry bill is not the constitutional carry. It is statewide preemption is included in that. Because as of right now, the two biggest cities in the state are very, very anti-gun. And they have regulations that prevent people from owning or possessing firearms. They are not federally prohibited or even prohibited at the state level. So if you live in, say, the city of Lincoln... There are certain misdemeanors. There was an incident years ago that we actually covered on the Geeks, Gadgets, and Guns podcast where an individual was in a car with a friend who got pulled over for speeding. The person was not driving. They were a passenger. They informed the officer they had a knife. It was, uh, I think, about a quarter inch over the legal length limit of three and a quarter inches, I believe, is what Nebraska's knife limit is. Yeah, kind of stupid. You can have a carry permit, but you can't do that. So he gets a misdemeanor offense, like a $75 fine, and then finds out later he is no longer allowed to possess any guns or ammo or any of it because the city of Lincoln passed an ordinance saying, hey, you had a weapons misdemeanor. You're no longer allowed to possess your guns. Moves outside the city. He's fine. That's the kind of stuff we're looking at here in Nebraska. Not to mention city of Omaha. We we like saying as gun people, oh, yeah, you don't have to register your firearms. City of Omaha, Nebraska, actually requires you to register your firearms. So you can go to a gun store, you can buy a gun, but then you have to go and register it before you can take possession of the arms. They use a more strict version than what the actual federal level of what is prohibited as to whether or not you can get your permit and register your handgun. That's right. In order to purchase a pistol in Nebraska, you have to go to your local law enforcement center. So normally that's going to be your police station or your sheriff's office for my county. They're actually combined in the same location. They call it the law enforcement center. So which one is it? Don't really know. But you go to your local law enforcement and then you have to ask them permission, pay them 10 bucks and wait a week to find out whether or not you can buy a pistol. Now, the ticket is at least good for three years. You have a concealed carry permit in the state of Nebraska you can go and buy a handgun without needing the handgun purchase permit. But then you get into the problems of the concealed carry law. Like, you have to apply in person for a Nebraska concealed carry permit. You need an eight-hour course to do it. Okay, so it's not the worst. But you have to have live fire as part of that training. Yep. Honestly, where I live in the state, we are a good ways away from the locations you can apply. Nearby states like the state of Iowa, South Dakota... Those states, I do am quite familiar with the process. You go to the local sheriff's office, you apply there. Not necessarily in Nebraska. You have to go to a state patrol headquarters, schedule an appointment in advance, and then you can apply. Unfortunately, for any and all Nebraskans, if you don't live in Omaha or Lincoln, you're kind of up the creek without a paddle because there are a grand total of six locations in the entire state of Nebraska in which you can apply for your concealed carry permit. For me... Where I live, that means even though I am on the populous edge of the state, there are two locations that are near to me. One of them is 100 miles. The other one is 60 miles. The way of geography and the way the roads run, both of them take an hour and a half drive for me to get through, get to. 
Ironically, the 100 mile away one is a little bit easier to get to, not to mention it's in a bigger town, so you, you can actually do other stuff when you go down to apply, but that is an hour and a half one-way drive. Most of that drive, ironically, is taken through the state of Iowa. <laughs> yeah, a little ridiculous. But either way, you're looking at about 100 miles and an hour and a half drive, maybe 60. That's for me. I'm on the populous edge of the state. Three of the locations are on the eastern third of the state. You have three other locations for the rest of the state of Nebraska. I, I, I can't believe they still justify that. And that is not the worst and most egregious problem we have. Unfortunately, in the decade I have lived in this state, there has not really been any will in the legislature to actually fix the carry law. And the truth is, listening to the debates on constitutional carry, just making it so, hey, you can have your permit and you don't have to drive huge amounts of times to apply. Uh, there have been countless senators who are actually perfectly fine with saying, oh, yeah, you have to live in the state for six months before you're allowed to apply. There's one way around that, and that's if your previous state had a carry permit and you had a carry permit there and is a, one recognized by the state of Nebraska. Not just having one from another state or having one from that other state that – they recognize a permit from that state. It must be the permit they recognize from that state in order for you to be allowed to apply in less than six months. Doesn't matter if you have a mortgage, doesn't matter any of it. You have to live here for six months before you're allowed to apply. Yeah, that's honestly not even the worst of it. One of the fun ones that they give us is you can have no alcohol in your system at all, not even in your blood or urine. So if it's detectable in you, you're not allowed to carry at all. Now, it can be argued, in your blood, no, you shouldn't. But in your urine, that means it's already been filtered out of your blood and is no longer going to be affecting you. But unfortunately, that's the way it is. We also have this lovely thing called duty to inform. And let, let's, let's do some quoting here. Whenever a permit holder who is carrying a concealed handgun is contacted by a police officer, so a peace officer or emergency services personnel... The permit holder is, shall immediately inform the peace officer or emergency services personnel that the permit holder is carrying a concealed handgun. That's per Nebraska, Nebraska Statute 69-2440. And you must have both your permit and a photo ID in your possession in order to be carrying in the state of Nebraska. Unfortunately, to get the constitutional carry bill through... If you fail to inform three times, it becomes a felony. First three times, first two times, it's a misdemeanor. Third time, it's a felony. And even at that, with having that in there, I'm still not sure we're going to get the bill through this year. Unfortunately, we have a senator who is currently protesting certain bills that are probably going to pass. And so she's filibustering everything to basically draw the entire legislative session this year to a halt. Constitutional carry may go by the wayside because of that. Unfortunately, we can't do anything about it. We can own NFA items here, but what? You want to carry when you go to your doctor's office? No, that, that, that's illegal by state law. <sighs> and honestly, there are more areas that are not kosher by state law. It's actually ridiculous. Places of worship... Anything sponsored by a public or a private school, completely off limit. So let's say they rent out a hall for it, even if it's a public venue that normally you could carry in. No, because they have a school event there. Professional or semi-professional athletic event. Banks. It's, yeah, polling places, governing bodies, courtrooms, detention facilities, police, sheriff, state patrol, all that. I mean, some of those make sense, but then again... There's a lot of these that don't. And the very fact that you decide, hey, yeah, no, it's kosher that we have six places in the entire state to apply, that's a problem. But honestly, I'm just looking forward to the preemption because Omaha believes every gun that travels through there must be registered. Luckily, if you have a concealed carry permit, you don't have to comply with the registration requirement. But if you don't have a carry permit, they want you to register it. And who knows when another town will just get it in their head to, hey, we're going to pass more anti-gun laws. I should probably bring up one other thing. Because we have in the city of Lincoln, that is the state capital of the state of Nebraska, 
they decided to bring in a police chief from California. And she currently believes and testified under oath to the state uh, judiciary committee that, let's see, let's quote this. First, in order to legally carry a handgun concealed, the current CHP statuses mandates the firearm is carried unloaded. Second, if faced with a threat, the citizen has the appropriate amount of time to load and chamber around to respond to an imminent threat. Third, she supports the criminal mandates because she asserts the time to load and chamber instead could be used to call 911 and let the professionals address the situation. Yes, that is the current police chief in the city that is the state capital of Nebraska. Yeah, she's a transplant from California to become police chief. But she truly, truly believes that the law requires you to carry with an empty chamber and that you are required to know and you can totally defend yourself in time that you will know in time to chamber around and defend yourself. That's not actually part of the law. She's just ignorance and she's using that and trying to use that to prevent us from getting the constitutional carry bill, which really is the, hey, this carry bill really needs to be reformed at least so people can go and apply at their local sheriff's office because geez where i live on the populous side of the state three hours and then it takes about 45 minutes to an hour to get printed so you're talking about four hours half a work day or darn close to it and there are where there are places in the state i've looked at it you're talking five six hours in some parts of the state to get to the nearest location that's not kosher. And I'm talking five to six hours one-way travel. That is horrible. Unfortunately, what people think of as Red America is not always as gun-friendly as you think. And nobody's trying to touch removing the, per the pistol purchase permit. Not yet. That's a long-term goal. Right now, we've spent the last decade trying to get preemption, and we still don't have it. So, remember, Red State America... Not always as gun-friendly as you would hope, but that just means you need to get involved. Because I remember when I moved here to Nebraska, Iowa was far worse on terms of things. At this point, Iowa has become far better than this state. The only thing that Iowa does not allow is machine guns. So that's what an active and involved 2A activist group can get you. You can take some terrible laws, and in a few years... You don't get everything in one sweep, but you keep coming back and back and back, and then you have some of the best carry laws and gun laws in general in the nation. Get involved. Seriously, get to your state organization, find out who they are, and work to advance gun rights in your state. Hey, Aaron, this kind of reminds me of Florida. <laughs> okay why florida people often refer to it as the gunshine state and oh it's the you know it's this you know super right-wing crazy place and has republican majority and ron DeSantis is the governor and meanwhile florida's got some goofy gun laws and really isn't able to make a whole lot of progress on modernizing itself in there it seems to be kind of perpetually stuck in the 90s <laughs> well florida is a very purple state yes and but, but i want to point that out we aren't uniformly purple we have pockets of deep blue and pockets of bright red and your eye sees them and it all just kind of shifts into this miasma of purple as your brain tries to reconcile it <laughs> Florida is very schizophrenic. But also, I mean, like we were, we were throwing some shade at Donald Trump earlier. The even even some of the Republicans are anti-gun. You talk about the the the, the Republicans in the southern part of the state. Uh, Miami Republicans. <laughs> yeah. And so we have we have all those yeah, various politicians that say that they're for our second amendment rights but really aren't. And then of course there's also the United States as a whole. Again, we had President Trump and we had a majority in both the House and the Senate. And Trump spoke at the 
at the National Rifle Association and was an NRA endorsed candidate and he was, you know, had a had a, had a New York concealed carry permit and allegedly actually carried firearms. And so it's like one of those like, oh wow, this this might be something amazing. Like and, and then immediately, like as soon as he took office, introduced the Hearing Protection Act introduced national reciprocity and they were good bills and they were i mean there were pedantic people that said they weren't exactly the perfect bills but they were pretty darn good bills and where do they go nowhere we get a bump stock ban so yeah the we really need to cultivate more people who are actually our friends and again this that's not a partisan statement there there should the Second Amendment is not a partisan issue, and so therefore there's well, should... it it is, but it shouldn't be. How about that? Yes, it it should not be a partisan issue. So we should absolutely be having a ton of pro gun Democrats that are not you know not dinos Democrat in name only. They're legit Democrats and uh, and are in good standing with the party, and also believe that people should have guns. I mean, they used to exist. They were called Blue Dog Democrats, but I haven't seen them for at least a decade, if not more. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. So, and and that was even with the 1994 assault weapons ban. It was more or less Democrats passed it and Republicans, you know, Republicans voted against it. But there were a ton of Republicans that voted for it, and there was a ton of Democrats that voted against it. So it was somewhat nonpartisan even back then. Uh, or back then so recently. But yeah, the there has definitely been a, a major shift and there doesn't need to be as far as guns go. So yeah, there's well, at least they're they're pushing the laws. Hopefully this uh hopefully they will get their, their uh, red flag law shot down because it's garbage and get their uh uh their constitutional carry because it's awesome. And so we wish the best to to, to the people of Nebraska. Yeah, I think they have a better chance of being the 26th than Florida. Mm-hmm. I mean, I'd like us to be the 26th, but I don't think it's going to happen. Yeah, we'll see. There was a talk that uh, that DeSantis was at a book signing and someone was asking him about it. And he he said some things that that were that were favorable. He, he says things. Trump says politicians say things. Don't listen to what they say. Listen to what they do. I, I, um, exactly. My the, thought. Th- the thing is, though, the, the law that's on the Florida books last time I checked it's it's not even constitutional carry. It is the most ass backwards thing that I have seen. It's essentially you can, and, and this is the law. As of the last time I looked at it, it could have changed, but the law was you could carry concealed without a license, and and that's it. It's definitely not constitutional carry, nor is it permitless carry. You can't carry openly. It's just if you want to carry concealed, you don't need a permit to do that. Mm-hmm. It it's why. <laughs> I mean, I I suppose it's better than nothing because that way people can carry concealed to defend themselves. I mean, I, okay, that that's actually good. It's just why are we taking the absolute lowest when we could go for so much more? I don't understand. This is why I don't analyze politics because. It makes my brain hurt. I don't understand why people do things. I do it so I can be wrong. I can make all these predictions and all these great things, and I can tell you exactly why, and then they they do they'll come true. Just like being a marine biologist, I could be standing there on the dock casting reels, and I'm going to tell you how how my uh, my my setup is going to absolutely drive the fish wild, and I'm going to be pulling a whole bunch in and just get skunked. I have a good I have a good dissertation on why I caught a lot of fish. I just don't have any fish. So Weird tells me I should keep segment introductions short and sweet. And so now for this segment, Xander has dubbed it Squib Games. Hi and welcome to Gun Lovers and Other Strangers. In this segment, I'd like to revisit Oddball's alleged firearm, his prized Altor. Weird had previously raised the question, is the Altor bore loose enough to prevent a squib if an underpowered load is fired? As this is the kind of science I love, I decided to try and answer his question. For those who aren't familiar with the term, a squib is when a round of ammunition doesn't produce sufficient pressure when fired, resulting in the bullet getting lodged in the barrel. 
a very unsafe situation. A fired shot resulting in a squib will sound and feel differently than a properly functioning round. Recoil will be softer, and muzzle blast will be muted. If fired in dim lighting conditions, a squib will also look different as there will be little to no muzzle flash. There can be a variety of causes for a squib, including contaminated powder or primer, insufficient powder, no powder at all, or even a manufacturing defect in the cartridge case, such as no flash hole being drilled in the primer pocket. First things first, do not try this at home. I'm what you might call an expert. I'm familiar with the stresses involved with this type of experiment, as well as safe gun handling and proper reloading techniques. On to the experiment! Starting with some measurements. The Sporting Arms and Ammunition Manufacturers Institute, better known as SAMI, lists standard dimensions for a 9mm barrel as 0.346 inches bore diameter and 0.355 inches groove diameter. Both of these measurements have an allowed plus-minus tolerance of 0.004 inches. According to my dial caliper, the bore diameter of the Altor barrel is almost exactly 0.350 inches, or 0.004 inches over size. This is at the very top end of the allowed range, but still within specification. Due to the nearly non-existent rifling on the Altor barrel, it was impossible to get an actual measurement of this dimension. However, the Altor website lists the rifling grooves in their barrels as 0.005 inches deep. This would make groove diameter 0.360 inches or 0.005 inches over size, just beyond the maximum dimension according to Sammy. Due to safety concerns, I decided to use a 115 grain plated bullet. This type of projectile has a soft lead core and a very thin coating of gilding metal, an alloy of copper and zinc. This thinner coating is more easily deformed by the rifling compared to the thicker jacket of standard ball ammunition. The before firing diameter of the bullet was 0.355 inches, right in the middle of the acceptable SAMI measurement. I loaded this bullet in a properly sized 9mm case with a Winchester small pistol primer, but no powder at all. The bullet was seated to proper depth and overall length, then taper crimped to standard specifications. Then it was time to load and fire. In accordance with proper safety protocol, I treated this as any other test fire meaning a proper backstop along with eye and ear protection. I also, being left-handed, fired the Altor with my right hand. After the expected pop of firing a primer-only cartridge, I removed the barrel and looked at the results. The case was completely coated with soot. This was due to none of the primer combustion residue being able to escape the barrel, as well as there not being enough pressure to expand the case and properly obdurate the chamber. Regarding the purpose of the experiment, even using a softer plated bullet, the projectile barely made it past the end of the chamber. To remove the bullet, I placed the barrel in my vise using soft jaws and drove the bullet out with a properly fitted punch. The measurement after extraction showed the bullet was now only 0.353 inches in diameter. This change was due to the swaging effect from forcing the bullet through the barrel. In the image of the bullet post-firing, it's possible to see the torn plating at the base caused by the friction from the barrel on the bullet during removal. The result of the experiment was clear. Even with a barely rifled, slightly oversized barrel, it is still possible to get a squib in an Altor. I had fun putting all this together, and I hope our listeners, but especially Weirdbeard, enjoyed my recounting of the details. Keep your ammunition dry and your guns where you can find them in the dark. Hey, everybody, this is Three Dog, your friendly neighborhood disc jockey. Now listen close for this important public service announcement. Listen, kiddos, never forget the importance of periodic weapon maintenance. Rifle, pistol, police baton, I don't care which. If your weapon is falling apart, the only wasteland asshole it's going to kill is you. So be smart. Salvage those parts and make repairs whenever you can. Now, some music. That about wraps up this segment. If you have any questions for me or suggestions for future segments or a comment on a past segment, please post them on the Assorted Calibers podcast Facebook or MeWe pages, and Aaron or Weir will make sure I see them. I'm also a contributor on the Blue Collar Prepping blog, which can be found at bluecollarprepping.blogspot.com. We're always looking for people interested in submitting posts to the blog, so please check out the site. Finally, I'm a published author, and books with my stories can be found on Amazon under the name Brenna Bock, that's B-R-E-N-A-B-O-C-K. I'm also now in anthologies published under my actual name, 
Look for David Bach on Amazon, just not the guy who writes the computer books. That's all for now. Thanks for listening. I'm David, and this is Gun Lovers and Other Strangers. So I, I'm actually looking at a bullet on my desk right now, and uh, it's not as it's not as dramatic as I as I remember it, uh, but uh, it was it was specifically was a day when I was reloading and I got distracted on multiple times and suddenly went to go weigh a powder charge and realized there was already a powder charge in the scale, which meant I forget to dump one of them into one of the cases. So somewhere in a five bullet set, there were, there was a a five cartridge set. There was a cartridge that had no powder. And so, well, I mean, th- that should be pretty easy. You just you, you know the weight you're going for, so you just weigh the five. Well, the difference is that the it was five grains of powder in a, in forty in a forty five case, and then in a with a uh, uh, with a uh, a two hundred thirty grain bullet, and I forget how much the case the the the, di- the difference was not enough that I could easily detect it. I was not. I tried all that, and you could have just said you don't have a scale sensitive enough. That's true. I do not have a scale sense enough to tell the difference between that powder load. So instead, I just set those five cartridges aside, and I could have just pulled all the bullets and just reloaded the cases, but that would have been messy and taken time. So instead, I decided I would just bring those to the to the range in a, in a little Ziploc bag, and I would shoot those last. And so when I was finishing up my range session, I went bang, bang, pop, there it is. And then, again, the... Very similar to David's situation, uh, the the bullet was just inside the rifling. But again, it's it's an interesting experience to see a bullet that's stuck in a rifle barrel because uh, or a rifled barrel, um, because you know you you just don't think of how that 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 bullet needs to make a gas seal. So it is absolutely getting smushed into that, uh, into, into those, into those riflings. And it it is a tight squeeze. And so I think we've all seen that, that cutaway picture of, I think it was like a Colt Python that someone dumped like two cylinders worth of rounds into. Yeah, actually we, we we were actually, that that came up the other night when we were, uh, during a film track and uh, yeah, David, it was actually, it was a Smith of Wesson, 28 29 not 29 but uh uh, uh yeah i think it was a smith and wesson 28 the the 357 magnum uh, large frame and yeah they had definitely reloaded at least uh, reloaded at least once huh funny it's not hitting anywhere uh, to be fair i did put two uh uh two it might have even been three uh uh three squibs in a uh in my in my colt trooper because i loaded a um i i, I, lo- I try was trying to load some wad cutters as slow as i could possibly go and literally you could actually catch a glimpse of copper before the target ripped and these rounds were going so slow they were ripping the target not they were wad cutters but literally they were tearing like large holes in the paper and you would fold the paper back up and you could see the sooty imprint of the wad cutter on the paper. Uh, But as soon as the barrel fouled up a little bit, they were going so slow that they, they actually got stuck. But the, in my defense, they were also getting slowing down enough that they were, they were starting to, to lose stability. And so like I was getting rounds just like going all over the place. So pulling the trigger and not seeing an actual mark on the page after some of my shots were going way wild didn't get me. But then, yeah, then I realized, Oh, this isn't good. The round stuck in there. (laughs) And so my gunsmith put, put, put a guide on and ran a drill bit down my barrel (sighs) and everything was fine. But, well, that's good because I mean I, I've seen some pictures of barrels that have had multiple squibs l- stuck in them, and sometimes it's like, "Ooh, that is visibly distorted. That's not good." Oh, I mean that 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 Smith and Wesson barrel you were talking about is visibly bulged. 
and so yeah, this that that that's a bad news. But either way, I I've, I've got this forty five bullet that that I hammered out of my gun, and you can clearly see the where the rifling was in, in, engraved on it. And granted, the Altor does have micro rifling, and that case is really that bullet is really scratched up in the pictures. I just I just wonder how much the rifling imprinted. But uh, thank you so much, David, for doing this because we were talking we just been talking about how crude the rifling is on the Altor and I was wondering if it actually took hold of the bullet and I realized it clearly would otherwise it would just get gas blow by and the bullet really wouldn't even exit the barrel so what you're saying is that David didn't actually need to do this segment I mean I don't make him do it (laughs) oh he would have done it anyway but yes and and, and I will and and, and I will say right now that that I really enjoyed the hell out of this, and I was glad. And and uh, make sure to check out the show notes for the pictures because they will definitely be well worth your time. And I'll probably actually snap. I'll snap a little picture of my bullet to see if I can uh, if I can recreate uh, David's for an actual forty five. It's also it's also a plated bullet as well. So I don't know. We'll see. But now it, we t- we talked about a weird firearm with that Altor. Now we're just going into the weird, bizarro world of what anti-gunners consider logic. Marty Hayes of the Armed Citizens Defense Network discuss the court case where the ACLDN is banned from practicing by the very same people who want to mandate insurance for gun owners. I am pleased to welcome back to the Assorted Calibers podcast, uh, Marty Hayes, who is the president of the Armed Citizens Legal Defense Network. And uh, the last time we talked, we were talking about the potential mandates for insurance that really haven't come to light yet. Uh, But uh, many of the anti-gun forces are saying that uh, people who own or carry firearms should carry some form of insurance. And of course... Armed Citizens uh, Legal Defense Network is not a insurance program uh, at, at all, but it does behave similar to it in certain senses. Uh, but uh, there was a, a recent story out of the the state that you guys are based out of Washington State, uh, where they are actually attacking you. Right, we have an anti gun insurance commissioner here, and an anti gun attorney general, and an anti gun governor. And between that, those, that three-person uh, cabal, they have they decided to go after all of the companies that were offering "quote unquote" self-defense insurance. And it started with the NRA, and they were attacking the NRA, and then it morphed out into pretty much all of the other companies involved in the this very small industry. Uh, and so they they not only decided to attack us, but also uh, the other companies. And interestingly, all of the other companies agreed to stop selling their self-defense insurance in Washington state. And then they, they signed letters of agreement saying, okay, we'll quit. We were wrong because Washington state says you have to have a license to sell insurance in the state. And they didn't have not have licenses. Uh, and so they were found to be uh, in violation of the law. They paid fines and they quit selling their version of self-defense insurance in Washington State. Well, because we have no insurance component in our benefits, uh, we don't have any insurance underwriters, uh, that sort of thing. We said, no, we're not going to agree to this. Uh, we will fight you on this at every turn. So... We fought them in their administrative battle, so to speak, where they had their own attorney on staff with the Office of Insurance Commissioner uh, look at all the facts and have a a kind of a hearing on it. And this person decided that we were, in fact, insurance. Uh, And so that was the first time we we lost a case there. They fined us $200,000 of which we uh, did not agree to pay. Uh, eventually, they knocked the fine down to $50,000, and we paid that under protest. 
because if we didn't, it would have opened up a whole bunch of other legal issues. Uh, but we also appealed that to uh, Superior Court. The Superior Court judge basically phoned in his decision saying that, you know, I don't know for sure what's going on here, but I agree with the insurance commissioner. And so we uh, appealed that decision to the Washington State Court of Appeals, Division Two, and now we've been involved in that process for about the last six months. Uh, and we're going to have a hearing on that appeal March 13. Hopefully that will end it for us and we'll get our money back that we we paid the fine and protest over. And that's basically what we're looking at. The whole, the whole issue is whether or not what we do is considered insurance. And our argument is it can't be insurance because of the intentional act component of use of force and self-defense. You don't know it's going to happen to you. And so if it happens to you, then, then you've got insurance to cover that. Well, anytime a person uses force in self-defense, that's not a fortuitous event. They know exactly what was going on. They, and they purposefully, intentionally uh, use that force and, and perhaps injured someone or if nothing else, threatened them uh, to be injured. And so that's our, our belief is that we're not insurance. It has to be some type of accident or non-intentional act that would allow insurance to kick in. Now, having said that, the other companies that have the insurance component, they basically can rely upon you being prosecuted as the fortuitous event. Yeah, you use deadly force in self-defense, but you had no clue whether or not you're going to be prosecuted. If you're prosecuted, then your insurance kicks in. Uh, of course, the problem is we don't want you to be prosecuted to begin with, and so our member benefits kick in long before there's a prosecution, uh, starting with the educational concept, educational benefits, and then the instant, instantaneous hiring of a legal team to defend you. So if the prosecutor is deciding to prosecute or not, then you've already got legal counsel to help thwart that and not become a prosecution. Yeah, I find it extremely ironic that that there are so many states. We've, we've got, uh, obviously, California, Illinois are the ones that come right to mind that have actually passed uh, rules uh, demanding gun owners have insurance. Uh, but obviously, it's been talked about in many of the states. I know I, I live in Massachusetts, and Massachusetts has absolutely talked about it as well. Uh, and, and it's generally a boilerplate discussion from many of the anti-gun lobbies uh, saying that we must carry insurance if we're going to be carrying dangerous arms. And yet here you are offering a service to help out people who might find themselves in a, uh, a, a financial issue uh, and legal issue because they are carry carrying a firearm and they're saying that you guys can't practice. And, we're, and we don't have any insurance components. What's interesting is, on one hand, the anti-gun people are calling for all gun owners to have insurance. On the other hand, there are states like New Jersey and New York and California and Washington who are saying, you can't have self-defense insurance. And so what are you going to do? Yeah. I mean, it is, it's is—it's just ironic. But you guys are, are, are having your day uh, in court uh, coming up soon. So uh, we absolutely wish you luck. And uh, will you be back on the show if uh, if they, with an update on how that goes? I'd be happy to. Excellent. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure having you on. Uh, Marty Hayes of the Armed Citizens Legal Defense Network. All right. So weird. March 13th has come and gone. Have you heard from Marty about this case? I have not, and I didn't think to uh, to, to to reach out to him because I actually literally just listened to this uh, interview for the for a second time just to refresh myself a couple hours ago and realized, oh, yeah, that is close. And I did a quick search. I haven't been able to find any news reports on it, so I don't know if they've 
if it, number one, I don't know if the if, if they they got delayed or not. So I don't know if they actually got their day in court, and uh, and then I, I don't know if if they're waiting on a ruling or what the story is. I will I will actually reach out to Marty and I will try to get an update uh, for uh, for next week. Because uh, yeah, I just realized. Oh yeah, that's that was a that was a couple of days ago. So that was literally a week ago. Mm-hmm. So yeah, we will. I I will touch back. Certainly, win, lose, or draw, I will have Marty back on because I I, I want to hear how this goes. Because again, it's just such a wonky court case. Because you know, in the in in the last last week we we had Marty on, he was talking about how um on how the courts you know the, where these laws are coming through where they're mandating insurance and. There's no such policy. Like nobody even knows what that means because there's no policy in existence that that meets this requirement. And by the nature of how insurance works, this may not be legal because firearms accidents really just don't really happen in the United States. Pretty much anybody who's catching a bullet got shot on purpose, whether it be suicide or 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 homicide or self-defense it's all people intentionally shooting somebody else for a litany of reasons and so ensuring an intentional act like if you burn your if if you burn your house down for the insurance money like if they catch you they're going to take that money back so if you shoot somebody, whether it's for lawful self-defense or you're just straight up murdering somebody and you're going to collect your insurance, it's it's just it, it's not legal. It's not going to work. But they're talking about mandating it. And then at the same time, they're saying that the various uh, uh, companies that offer, you know, insurance or uh, or uh, legal help. Uh, can't practice within the state uh, is just ridiculous. And of course it all comes back to NRA carry guard <laughs> for something as short lived as it was. It sure poisoned a lot of wells. I'm really surprised that the other organizations, I'm not really sure what to call them. Cause as we said, they aren't insurance. Some are, some but aren't, but, but yeah. anyway, for, for this, discussion we're going to call them insurance companies Mm -hmm. um i'm really surprised that the other companies uh didn't fight and instead they just rolled over and and paid a fine and just completely wrote off that state as uh yeah and and all the potential customers therein i i don't understand it because it seems like they could have talked it over with the other companies and said hey we're pretty sure this isn't legal we should fight this Mm -hmm. And it would be a much different court case, I think, if instead of just ACLDN versus the state of Washington, was it? Washington. You know, it would be ACLDN and USCCA and Second Call and whoever else versus the state of Washington. Mm Mm-hmm. Um, I, I I don't understand why this happened. It's a rhetorical. I don't expect you to know. I don't expect anyone to tell me. It's just a case of I don't understand why certain companies seem to work against their own interests. Yeah, I think probably one of the biggest difficulties is just herding cats, is just getting people to band together and getting people to agree as a unified front on what to do. And then furthermore, you've got the point that uh, – you know, I think I think all the groups that you me- mentioned were are are all non insurance companies. They do not have their their endowments, so they have money that they can release to you and can release can release to wo- lawyers and expert witnesses and and various other services to help you. But um, but they're not an insurance component. But there are some people. NRA Carry Guard was insurance, um, and there may be others that uh, that I'm unaware of that are also an actual insurance company with underwriters. And so those people, they got them dead to rights. It's if they don't, if you don't have the license to practice within the state, you, you can't do it. So that's a law is a law. Uh, so that, that could also have been a factor as well. 
Well, you know who else is a factor weird? Yes. Well, that'd be our listeners. Our listeners, and we'd like to thank them, each and every one of you. Thank you so much for listening and supporting our show. But you can support us more by by becoming a member on Patreon. To become a Patreon patron, go to patreon.com slash the Sorting Calibers podcast to sign up. Patrons get an early lease of the podcast, plus bonus content like the hilarious blooper reels, the ACP film tracks, and the ACP Magnum. Also, please remember to rate us on Apple Podcasts. Subscribe to us on the platform of your choice and share the show with your friends, both online and off. I got a blog. It's called Weird World. That's W-E-E-R-D World dot com. And hear me weekly on Handgun Radio on the Firearms Radio Network. I mean, is it really a blog if the only thing you do is just link a copy of the ACP segment for the week? I have a great idea for a blog post and I just haven't had time to do it. Okay, I'm going to hold you to that. It, It involves Ryan Boosie. (laughs) <laughs> so you probably don't frequent the same perverted places i do i sure do but okay, i sure do but, but i i say it on purpose uh, well okay but the point being is that um bussy is slang for boy pussy yes okay i didn't know if you knew that and and it is specifically a the, the bussy is specifically, specifically a part of the anatomy which uh, has some similarities to a certain Kimber executive turned gun control activist. <laughs> yeah, you heard me. And you can get more from me at linktree slash Aaron Paulette. That's linkter.e forward slash Aaron Paulette. All one word. And thanks to Nate Spencer for our music. So I'm an ART. I am an original, authentic artwork, and I have intrinsic value. And Weird Beard is an FART. He's an old fart. Our post-nominal letters are assorted, and so is our podcast. Good night, everybody. I'm practically a doctor. (laughs) 